question that is really on everyone's lips at the moment uh, who have seen you talk before, which is how soon are we going to see these fantastic things uh, that you all talked about? So if, when you answer the question, if you could just quickly recap what it is that you're going to bring into the world. Uh, we'll start with you, Ed, because uh, you weren't here earlier. So brain technology, of course, is uh, sort of a slow field in some ways, in the sense that you have to do clinical trials. There needs to be evidence of eff efficacy. Um, and there's also, of course, a sort of a progression where brain technology uh, makes its way, if it's safe and efficacious, for ever more um, broader applications. So deep brain stimulation, for example, invented 30 years ago uh, for people with movement disorders. And just about four years ago, uh, there was actually um, a use of a deep brain stimulator for an, an autistic uh, adolescent patient. So you start to see these technologies that are successful, they're safe and efficacious, will, will broaden in, in utility. And that can be a multi-decade process. For some of the newer technologies, though, because they require deep knowledge of the brain, their adoption curve will probably be um, a bit slower even. You know, we are, for example, the technology that I discussed earlier, where we use light to control brain cells, those technologies require genes to be brought into the body. And gene therapy, of course, is a very uh, fast moving, but also um, uh, you know, with risk and with difficulty, and, and the trials are expensive and so forth. Uh, so uh, already human trials are beginning with some of these tools, but only for parts of the nervous system where we know a lot, like in the eye, you know, in the retina, in the back of our eye, there are neurons that we understand relatively well, and so people are working on prosthetics for the blind. But in the brain, you know, in the human brain, we don't even know how many kinds of cell there are in the human brain. Mm -hmm. And so I think applications in the central nervous system of uh, genetic modification neurotechnologies are, are gonna take some more science just to reveal what's going on and, and where to put these genes and these molecules and so forth. We will get into the, uh, the black box of the brain uh, in a minute. Janan, I wanted to ask you, because uh, choose either microphone. Um, I don't want to, uh, what's the word, make it sound like what you're making is very simple, but you have already put them on your skin, on the skin of your relatives. Uh, these were piezoelectric devices for harvesting energy and monitoring various uh, things about the body. If you're already putting them on the people, then why don't we all have them? You know, When do we get our hands on them? Is it about overcoming regulation? Um, uh, so for my field, um, I categorize devices into uh, class. One is implantable and the other ones are wearable. Implantable ones are internal devices and wearable ones external devices. So external devices are much easier to be in market sooner than the implantable ones. Uh, that's why when I gave my keynote, I would like to emphasize on um, internal mechanical energy harvester. First, we tried the experiment on heart because it was the extreme case. We just proved that that device, flexible, malleable device, can work on a beating heart. So if it can work on that delicate organ, the device can work anywhere we have motions. That's why now I'm working on the variable format of it. So we can place on our knee or joints or under our shoe. It will be much easier to be on the market. But at the same time, uh, we have to do uh, lots of experiments. It's not only cherry picking. We need to do several trials on various patients. For my skin module sample uh, device, for instance, uh, my first uh, clinical trial uh, was performed on 30 volunteers who uh, have a skin melanoma, skin cancer. But it was just a tiny uh, portion of the trial, we have to do uh, these trials on various peoples in different times. And also, these devices are external, as I said. So we have to make sure that devices are mechanically stable as well as electrically stable. So doing an experiment in a day doesn't mean that you can get the same answer a year later. So you have to trial um, extensive mechanical cycling, for instance, to test how stable is the device over time. So now, right now, we are conducting more experiments on, human, uh, on humans mm -hmm. for long uh, periods uh, to what see the future. What about people who aren't so concerned about safety? I know that sounds strange, but um, you know, coming as I do, I see a lot of biohacker community, yeah. people who are willing to, uh, like me, put a microchip in their hand, although this is really uh, not much different from the ones in pets, so it's, uh, it's got a quite a track record. But people will do things such as um, uh, put magnets in their fingers 
so that they can feel electrical fields or put uh, chlorophyll extract into their eyes so they can see better in the dark. Uh, how difficult are the devices that you make to replicate you know, by another party who maybe wasn't interested in medicine but just wanted to make something cool? Uh, yeah, there is a fine line between cool and real core science <laughs> <laughs> that we do experiments and devices for them. Um, but for the core science, to understand what's happening in our body, uh, we surely uh, need to um, work on regulations. We cannot just do a device and place on a patient's, patient and um, uh, just run the experiment again and again. There is some rules that we need to uh, follow. But for the cooler side, I do at home, in my lab, on my students, on myself. I do all the time, but it's just for demonstrations. Um, but I do believe um, we are we are very we are we are we are just there. We will have devices in our body, and our wealth will be directly proportional with the number of the devices that we will have in our in in our own body. We have to have because imagine. Um, a world that we use right now as cell phones, and we personalize those cell phones, we change the ringtone, we change the wallpaper. So it will be the same. We will have devices in our body, and we will personalize those devices uh, to have a cool, cooler side in a party, and as well as to check our um, body uh, wealth and health. <laughs> and I think. Ned, this is uh, now that you've given your talk. I think I'm amongst probably a lot of people in the room who I'm almost agitated to see you on here on stage because I want you to be back in the lab working on getting this uh, anti-aging pill. You know, every every moment we wait is a is a is a delay. How soon are we going to get our hands on these these drugs? To dimensionalize timing, my first drug was 13 years from the first experiment to um, first commercial sale. Second drug was nine years. So the question is, what will the first senolytic drug's time scale be? Um, probably on the order of, you know, we started it five years ago. Um, my expectation is that our first drug, if everything went well, would be approved approximately seven years from now. Now, we're going to be in people in 12 to 18 months if a handful of experiments go the direction we want. So there will be people out there in clinical studies experiencing these changes to their biology. But I want to emphasize that our strategy initially is to treat diseases in which these cells are driving a disease process locally, like in your knee or in your eye. That's my ear. Eye is here. And um, point being is that if you were to go to the FDA and say, hey guys, I've got a great idea. I'm going to blow away an entire cell population from your body in a bunch of patients. Are you cool with that? Okay, you're going to get a big no. And so what we're doing is taking a more methodical approach to establish safety locally, efficacy, meaning proving in a human being that clearing this cell type actually can cure a heretofore inescapable aspect of aging. And once you've done that, then the future has taken root in the present. And my prediction is that if you flash forwarded, say, 20 years, you'd be looking at drug paradigms so you could be that mouse. The one on, the, not on the one on the left, the one on the right. Um, and what I mean by be that mouse is you'd have an agent that you took, say, once a year, once every two years, that killed these cells in your body, and a variety of disease states could get blocked, or in some cases actually walked backwards down the timeline. Now, our animals don't mostly age backwards, but there are a handful of effects where it literally looks in a tissue-specific way like they're younger than they were after you clear. So I think the answer is that um, most technologies are overestimated in the short run, but underestimated in the long run. And what I mean by that kind of counterintuitive statement is that I think in a few decades, you know, our children are going to be living in a world in which these things are common. 
This is an entirely new class of drugs. It's just going to take a little bit of time. But for most of us, it's a bit of a blink of an eye in our lives for these projects that take a decade. Any, uh, any volunteers for Ned's clinical trial, if you want to stay? Yeah, we've got a few hands. Not as many as I thought. I guess people are kind of comfortable, or at least maybe they're a bit you know, hairy about getting that in. Uh, Ed, the work that you're doing involves uh, genetics and getting into, we, we've seen talks already about using CRISPR to change the genetics of, um, of adults. We are, I guess, I use this term lightly because playing God and everything gets thrown around so much with every new development. But we are, uh, medicine is creeping into uh, such a fine detail layer of the human body, uh, areas we haven't gone before. Does the regulatory framework, um, is it appropriate for this? Uh, do we need stricter regulations, looser regulations? Uh, or are we, you know, is what we have just okay? Yeah, so there's a, a really interesting set of questions opened up about how uh, precision technologies, like gene editing, like ways of controlling brain cells very precisely and so forth, um, can be very targeted, but that also means you have to know what the targets are. And so a lot of the concerns, of course, are always about things like off-target effects and how do you know for sure that the cell that you change won't do something surprising five, ten years later or whatever. Um, one thought would be to build into these technologies the ability to upgrade them later. And so this is something that could be very uh, interesting. Suppose that you do a modification to, um, to a computer. You can roll that modification back if you want, right? You know, as long as the computer is still, you know, not is still operating. <laughs> so you, if you can find ways to undo a change um, and, and upgrade you know, uh, uh, technologies over time, that could be sort of an interesting sort of meta level to think about these um, technologies on. So one of the things that we've been thinking about is, you know, suppose that it takes um, a small number of years to invent a technology and a much longer number of years to do the trial, right? You know, is there a way to make sure that as new uh, ideas come along, we can keep the deployment uh, up to speed? And we, we see this in even in, um, in, in, in brain technology, where technologies that are undergoing trial now uh, are earlier versions of things that will be going, uh, that will be going to trial in the humans maybe in a couple of years and so forth. Uh, is there a way to make sure that the pipeline doesn't see bottlenecks at certain points, but also to make sure that you know, we have the ability at any time to always be doing the very best uh, deployment of technology that we can? And those are things that I think we do need to have discussions about, because they don't necessarily all fit within um, a model where so things are set in stone, you evaluate uh, you know, one thing at a certain point of time, um, and then that's that. Uh, how do you keep the pipeline uh, going? And also to make sure that things can be, can be debugged in a way, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, Shanad, you, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you can't just go sticking things in your body uh, without there being some kind of negative effects. What kind of uh, hurdles are there for things such as this battery which harvests energy from the heart to power a pacemaker. Um, I'm assuming you can't just stick it in there and, and it's, everything's okay. It's a bit more complicated. Yeah. Um, so today's pacemakers are needs to be replaced after, uh, uh, every six to seven years due to the depleted battery. So this exposes patients uh, like surgical, uh, uh, surgical problems and it's very costly. So, uh, but the technology that we developed um, is right now is also an implantable device. It's kind of a backup for the cardiac pacemaker. And we can generate for the certain uh, um, device that we uh, developed, can generate a power density 1.2 microwatt per centimeter square, which is uh, three times higher than a modern pacemaker needs. Uh, but in this case, um, the, hard, um, the device we we, we, we suture the device with medical sutures on the top of the heart uh, with three focal points. But, but I mentioned before, we need to check uh, what's happening inside the body cavity when the device is affected of, over, over a long time. F um, for the past experiments, we did only um, three months uh, trials, uh, and we just got uh, uh, permission to do uh, uh, survival work in which we will place the device on the heart and close the chest and watch the animal for a long time. Long means a year. This is only the permission for a year. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to develop and design a device. It's also difficult uh, to do in vivo and in vitro trials, as well as to get the permissions to do animal preclinical trials before we go uh, on humans. So. Um, there are challenges in designing the device, getting the permissions, 
and affixing the devices on the hard, uh, as well as the monitoring device over time. I will say that uh, in, within the biohacking, uh, you know, I don't know what to call it, community, if you can call it that, uh, biocompatible coatings for implants, and these people who are putting magnets or microchips under their skin, is a big deal. Um, and trying to find ones that are affordable that uh, you can get your hands on without having a research lab. Uh, people were using Sugru for a while, um, which, if you don't know, is sort of like a silicone putty that you use to sort of, it's almost like cork that you would use to you know, fix the tiles in your bathroom. Don't put Sugru inside your body, that's all I can say. Uh, it's, it's not a good idea at all. Um, Ned, what kind of uh, change, like, what strikes me about what you're doing is you're pro producing a drug that has a target market, or, well, not even a target market, has a market of 7 billion people. Um, so, yeah, tell us about that. You know, is this something that everyone will have to take constantly? You know, you know, I don't want to say have to take constantly, but this is a drug that you will have to, you will just assume will take this drug as you, as you live a normal life. You won't get sick first and then take it. Uh, that's correct. Um, the idea behind clearing senescent cells with these senolytic drugs is that the senescent cells take decades to accumulate. Um, and by the way, we don't know why that is, but children don't have them, and by the time you're a little over 30, you start to have them, and then when you're much older, you have lots and lots of them. The idea is you go to your physician, uh, you get treated, and when you kill the cells, they're dead. What that means is you're not taking that drug again for months or potentially years. We don't know. It has to do with the, the rate at which they reaccumulate. So let me just state that. But then secondly, the way we think about this from a commercial point of view, you know, biotech gets a bad rap because you know, a drug might cost a million dollars a year, but it's a disease you've never heard of that someone you've never met has. And that's a cynical way to characterize it, but many of the stories you hear about cost of healthcare is driven by that fact set. So close your eyes for a moment and pretend the opposite is true. Instead of it being a disease you've never heard of, that someone you've never met suffers from, pretend it's something that every single person in the world suffers from. So suddenly, something becomes possible. Instead of this drug being wildly expensive, it can be the cheapest drug ever. That's a cool idea. Like, what if you could get rid of half or two-thirds of the chronic diseases of aging with a drug that everyone took Imagine being able to redirect all of what we spend on healthcare as a government in the last year or two of very depressing, decrepit lives, and instead spend a tiny portion of that to prevent those diseases from occurring at all. I believe there's going to be an entirely new healthcare pricing model based on the idea of preventing chronic diseases of aging, and it will be way cheaper than what we do today. Uh, but people will still die. I mean, this is something that uh, I think what I'm struggling with is that you can, even if you can delay the, uh, the build-up of these senescent cells and the development of these, uh, these age-related diseases, you can only forestall them unless you had a perfect cure. Do you see what I mean? So that the cost of treating these diseases simply gets shifted to 20 years down the line rather than 10 years down the line. Uh, that's for well, a few points. So first, when we do clear senescent cells, we, at least in a mouse, we do not get a profound increase in maximal lifespan. It's actually small. It's like 10%. We get a profound increase in median lifespan. So what happens is the survival curve that in a normal creature kind of looks like, like this as it's dying. And these survival curves are rectangular. So it's, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm dead. And so we call that rectangularizing um, longevity, meaning that this period in which you're really sick and decrepit, rather than being this long, drawn-out, awful thing, is compressed 
into this very short period. And so the thinking, the thinking is that the duration of time in which you're suffering from chronic kidney disease, dementias, cardiac disease might be five times shorter. And rather than, for example, dying in your bed, 83 catheterized and demented, you die on the tennis court at 109 <laughs> while winning. Or, as one of my co-founders liked to say, um, murdered by a jealous lover at 113. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's a better vision. I know uh, you're a fan of sci-fi. To me, that sounds a little bit like Logan's Run, where everyone is beautiful and young, and then all of a sudden, they are, you know, swept up into the carousel and, and dead. They did it at 30, so you're promising us uh, at least four times that, which I think is a, a more attractive option. Uh, well, of course, you don't need carousel. You will actually die. As I mentioned, there are lots of reasons you age mechanistically. I predict it'll be a half dozen big ones. The, the mechanism I described today is just one. And it, if, you know, it is, however, one that drives multiple diseases of aging. So I don't think we're flirting with anything that feels like immortality. I think we are flirting with something that feels like dramatically extended youth. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ed, I want to come in. Before we were talking backstage, you said one of the big things holding us back with uh, sort of changing the way the brain operates, treating uh, neurological diseases, is that uh, you know it's in this box. All the brains in the world of living people are contained within this very sort of frustrating, uh, thick skull, and it's hard to know what's going on inside there. Yeah. Well, I think the. The complexity of the brain is, is truly enormous. I mean, one of the things that I was trying to think of a way to explain it is if you could scan a human brain, and uh, this is probably overkill, but to locate the identity of each molecule, and you could actually store all that data on hard drives, that stack of hard drives for one human brain, and let's just pretend it's uncompressed for now for sake of argument, it would reach way into outer space. And that's just one brain. So one of the big questions, I think, is if we want to understand how the brain's computing, we also need not just new tools to let us really see what's going on in the brain and how it's connected and how uh, the information is going to flow and so forth, but new ways of rapidly creating and testing theories of the brain. I think there's been a kind of a backlog of different theories of the brain because for a long time there had been uh, very few technologies that would let you really causally and precisely test a theory of the brain. But if we really want to understand what is a thought, what happens when we feel something, what happens when we make a decision or recall a memory from childhood, um, I think we're going to need to to, to find new ways of thinking about these processes. You know, it's sort of, you know, the, there's a sort of um, half jesting comment that if our brains were simple enough that we could understand them, we would be too simple to do that understanding. And I think that one of the possibilities is we need to uh, galvanize, um, you know, a lot of people talk about how maybe neuroscience um, ideas could lead to artificial intelligence. Maybe the opposite's also true. We need artificial intelligence to help us comprehend the brain and help us extract you know, minimal, meaningful representations of brain so we can do things like understand the human condition and understand our thoughts and feelings in a way that is comprehensible as, as human beings. Mm -hmm. And Janan, you are putting uh, electrodes into the brain. So uh, given the, what Ed says, we don't really understand a huge amount about it. How do you know you hit the right spot? I mean, you know, it's, is it just sort of a, like throwing a dart? You just think, let's fingers crossed, let's hope for the best. Uh, so what we do uh, in our needle type device, we have multi-channels. So in one electrode, we uh, apply voltage to the neuron. And then in through the another electrode, we measure the neuron potential. And once we know that we are at the right location through the uh, uh, neuron potential that we measure, then we uh, infuse multiple drugs at that location. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is a multifunctional and minimally invasive. Uh, a device, and I call this device spaghetti because it is initially stiff enough to insert in, to be inserted inside the brain, and then later on uh, there is a special polymer around it, so it dissolves in the body fluidics, brain fluidics, and becomes flexible and uh, move around with the brain itself. And by this way, we can minimize the mechanical uh, um, harm uh, inside the brain tissue. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me when uh, I got my first pair of hearing aids, they 
put me, sat me down and, and put them on and uh, turned them on. They said, okay, how does that sound now? And I said, this sounds terrible. Everything sounds really, really, really awful and tinny. And the doctor said, good, that's exactly, that means they're working correctly. And the problem is that my brain had gotten used to hearing with deaf ears, and now it had to relearn how to hear the world uh, using these bionic ears, using uh, the output from these hearing aids. And one of the questions I always have for people who work with the brain, how it almost feels like you're hitting a moving target. You know, if the brain is so plastic, and when you put your, your probe in and you start releasing drugs, does the brain you know, just adapt around it and start rooting things to a different area? Um, so the amount of the drugs that we deliver is really tiny, like picolator level or nanolator level. Uh, so when we infuse the, those drugs, we also have a um, very tiny uh, pressure sensor at the tip of the device, so we can measure the local pressure and make sure that uh, device, uh, sorry, the neurons are uh, fine under that pressure. And uh, what happens when we infuse the drugs, of course, they diffuse inside the, inside the brain tissue and then reach a certain region. We usually, it's, there is a special area how much uh, it can spread around inside the brain because we know the um, modulus, modulus value of the brain and we know the density of the drug. So we can easily estimate how, how far the drug can go and how the neurons can be interacted with the drug itself and what is the local pressure at that certain location when we infuse the drug itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ned, in your talk you mentioned one of the experiments in uh, fighting aging was to stitch these two routes together. If you missed his talk, you missed uh, a very interesting picture. And the, the young blood from, the blood from a young mouse was able to prolong the life of uh, an elderly mouse. You know, uh, I'm not the only one in the room that's thinking that sounds a bit like a vampire. Um, is anyone moving forward with that technology? I've sort of heard rumors that uh, you know, people are willing to buy young blood and, and put it through themselves in an effort to replicate this effect. Yes, so, well, to qualify your question, no one's going forward with the vampire implementation, um, because actually that doesn't work. If you drink it, it doesn't help. Um, so, um, oh, also, in addition, it wouldn't work for two different reasons. First of all, it doesn't work if you drink it. Secondly, if you stress out the young animal, it doesn't work. So we're a vampire to bite you. Needless to say, it's not exactly a relaxing experience. So I digress. Okay, there are a series of companies that are working on this. Um, one is called Alkahest, and what they're doing is they are basically making plasma from young people and are selling plasma um, to old people. And they are doing a clinical trial in which they are taking the young and putting into the old and measuring cognitive performance. And my prediction, it will work. It, that works in animals. And it would surprise me. It wouldn't be impossible. It would just surprise me if it failed in people. And so the moment that organization, and there are a few others like it, because there's no patents really, because it's People have had plasma for a long time, so it's kind of, you know, the Wild West. The moment, and I mean the moment, someone publishes a double-blind, placebo-controlled study in which you see cognitive enhancement with young blood, there are going to be 10 million people in the United States alone lining up with their checkbooks saying, me next. Now, that's when the FDA sends you a mean letter and says, hmm, 10 million people all wanting presumably uniform blood plasma. That feels like an accident waiting to happen. Okay. And this positive result will be regulated out of existence. That's my prediction. I, don't, I can't see the future. But if, you, if there is truly, or if there are factors in blood, circulating youth factors, that do this, it's going to be regulated, and the future, from a drug point of view, is not going to be plasma. It's going to be the purified factors themselves. And the individuals that find those factors are going to be the ones commercializing it. But it's going to be very Wild West in the beginning. There, I predict in the next 36 months, front page news will be, 
Alzheimer's regressed with young blood in a placebo-controlled clinical study, and there's going to be a complete freak out. And then there'll be mean letters, and there'll be arguments for compassionate use. But the primary reason that this would not be allowed to go forward isn't because the FDA is evil. They're not. The primary reason is that if your grandpa or your grandma has Alzheimer's and they go down to the clinic and they get their baggie of plasma, the FDA wants to ensure that your grandma and your neighbor down the street's grandma both got the same stuff. Because otherwise, some people are going to get better and some people, nothing is going to happen. And that's the way modern medicine works. That's how and it's worked out pretty well so far. And so my view is that the regulatory apparatus there is going to ultimately give rise to a better future, but there will be lots of whining and complaining when giant no commands are given by the federal government. On that note, uh, Ed, are there particular either countries or areas which are more favorable to human enhancement where uh, you know things are rushing ahead faster than they would be, say, here in Paris? Well, that's a good question. I mean, um, uh, a great bellwether is to look at gene therapy, right, as an area where um, there's been a multi-decade um, attempt to uh, try to use viruses to put genes into the body or to use chemicals to put genes in the body and so forth. And um, currently in the United States, there aren't any uh, you know, fully approved gene therapies, although there are many trials that are ongoing. In Europe, there's, um, there's a approval for a, a gene therapy for a lipopro lipoprotein lipase deficiency, an enzymatic deficiency that's um, fairly uh, rare, but can be, of course, quite serious. Um, so certainly, I think there are, there are different standards in different countries. You know, some places you have to prove safety and efficacy. Other places you have to prove safety, let's say, but then efficacy can be uh, maybe more explored by specific clinicians and so forth. And that's one difference between uh, US and European regulatory. Now, of course, if you don't go down a clinical regulatory path, then, um, then it becomes more protected by consumer product uh, entities. So, uh, you know, in the United States, for example, there have been a couple neurotech companies that have been marketing non-invasive neural stimulation, um, ways of stimulating the brain or nerves in the peripheral nervous system uh, to try to boost performance of some kind. There's one company trying to boost sports performance. There's another company that's been trying to uh, help people relax. And so those, if they're not making a health claim, um, are, are largely unregulated. So I think there's also that question. And then, uh, you know, I, I co-teach some bio-entrepreneurship courses at MIT. Uh, and one of the big questions that often comes up early is, do you want to make a health claim, go the regulatory path, um, and uh, ultimately perhaps confront diseases? Um, but there are also many conditions and situations where that's uh, difficult uh, to pursue or uh, logistically complicated for, for business or personal reasons. And, and that's also risky too, though, because if you uh, don't have any claim of, of efficacy, then it can be also difficult to, for people to want to, to bear the risk. And we've seen some of this with, with neural stimulation where, you know, since nobody really knows fully what happens when you stimulate one part of the brain, what happens to the rest of the circuitry, you know, does it make sense for, from a risk-reward uh, ratio? And you could argue that, you know, in, in modern bioethics, people are always thinking about balancing risk and reward. Are the people who are going to be benefiting the most, um, you know, uh, and therefore might, it might be worth taking the risk, uh, are those people uh, entering uh, these kinds of trials, if it's the case of a clinical technology, or for a consumer product, then it gets a, a little bit less um, uh, precise, of course. Um, and for those who might not benefit as much, uh, maybe they shouldn't be bearing as much of the risk. Do you think that's, uh, I mean, for me, you know, as, as someone who, who is going deaf, uh, I want my hearing aids to be able to function obviously the way we want. I understand we have to have regulation, um, but what's your answer to, say, someone whose, you know, mother is, uh, you know, has Alzheimer's and she's getting worse by the week and there's a drug that's come out that appears to work pretty well. Um, you know, what, wh how do you tell that person, no, you have to wait and you can't have it yet? Yeah, well, this goes back to this um, point that uh, was brought up earlier about compassionate use, right? You know, there could be um, cases where, again, the risk-reward ratio is highly skewed. Um, currently, for many clinical arenas, there are sort of controlled protocols. Like, you have to go through uh, treatments in, in a certain series of steps, like in certain cancers, for example. And then only if those fail does one go on into 
uh, more experimental treatments. I think this is a very active area of discussion because, again, uh, one wants to find ways to help as many people as possible, but also to make sure that people are not, you know, bearing unnecessary risk. So in the cases like this, where you know the compassionate use ratio could be, you know, really at one extreme, you know, maybe that does call for uh, really an open discussion about what what we as as a, a society and a species want to uh, to do for our our fellow humans. Shannon, this is obviously very close to you, Hart. Uh, in your talk, you talked about how you were inspired by your family members and, and the illnesses that they'd uh, suffered and how you wanted to, to address them. So, I mean, do you feel this frustration from both sides, as it were? Um, yeah, certainly. And this is my personal um, wish. I wish um, each and every government or country uh, has um, kind of um, pilot regulation uh, um, program in which the severe uh, patients can be treated with the new coming drugs or tools or techniques or devices uh, that are not in, in the market yet. Um, because I know very well I lost many family members because of cancer and uh, brain tumors, colon tumors, uh, and there was nothing to do at that stage. But um, I'm sure if, uh, if there is a regulation which allow us to use new drugs uh, to just to give a try, because we knew that, that family member will, will pass away in any ways. Uh, so with this case, actually, it will be really uh, open a new page for, for us researchers as well, so that we can um, define and guide our way more uh, effectively. Uh, if he can uh, have a chance to try our drugs or tools in a patient at early level, we can change our direction or uh, um, see the drawbacks or, of our devices or the test the eff efficiency of our device uh, uh, in a nice manner. Mm -hmm. And then for the drug that you're looking at in the, in the idea of extending uh, your, your health span, as you called it, uh, that to me is, it seems like a rather than a personal drug, that's a sort of public health issue, that we want a population who are healthy, therefore we spend less on, on medicating them. Uh, do you think that if this drug existed and it was on the marketplace, uh, there would be almost a stigma against not taking it? In the same way that we look at people who smoke or people who look at unhealthy and become obese, and we say, why are we spending money you know, giving you a heart bypass when you smoke and drink and you eat terrible food, and this is the reason that you need a heart bypass? Those, in that case, you, that person has made a decision to, to act in that way, but once you have the drugs, like you say, uh, that can slow down or you know, prevent some aspects of aging, uh, you're not making a decision, and yet you are going to get sicker earlier than other people. So do you think there will be almost a pressure on people, a societal pressure, to take these drugs? So you use the word stigma, um, and then you ask, do you think there'll be pressure? And let me separate those two issues. I don't think initially there will be a stigma. Uh, I say this because there are a variety of things all of us can do to forestall chronic disease, like diet and exercise. There are ways to prevent blindness in the, from glaucoma, which involves putting drops in your eyes two to four times a day. There are ways to prevent cardiovascular disease by taking your statins. These are all things in which human beings are uniquely terrible at compliance. Uniquely. Yet, we don't, for example, publicly humiliate these individuals. In fact, they're not even necessarily dinged from a healthcare reinforce, reimbursement standpoint. You know, there isn't kind of a multi-class system. So, I don't think there'll be a social stigma if history is any teacher. That said, I believe that given enough data as a, and this will be particularly true in like, you know, the UK in which you have single-payer healthcare. Um, so I believe that, you know, the NHS would do some sort of analysis and ask, wow, if we could give a, send a check out once a year for X number of dollars to every person willing to have directly observed therapy, we're going to shave our total annual budget for operating our company, or our country, by... 8%, you know, some massive change. 
You could like refinance your school system, you know, with just by sending money out to get people to swallow a pill once a year or go to see their physician once a year. I think it will be a push from government rather than a social stigma. In fact, my suspicion is that if there's any stigma, it might initially be the opposite, which is that you're cheating authenticity, you are doing something that's not sufficiently biblical, um, you know, sort of shit like that, okay, that's going to gradually demographically go away as old ideas and old people go away. I'm I moved to say that, you know, in this, sadly, in, you know, in this day and age, we still struggle with getting vaccine programs to work, which, you know, is a very clear, obvious uh, benefit. Um, but people, for various reasons, whether it's religious societal or, or, you know, personal belief, refuse to, to be vaccinated. So the idea of a... That's a way better example. He totally <laughs> kicked my butt. Okay. But yeah, the a, idea yeah. of the government giving a pill and saying, yeah. here, take this, it'll make yeah. everything better, I think yeah. is, is going to be hard to swallow for a lot of people. Very quickly, as we're running into the last minute, so I want to riff on that and say, Ed, is, uh, you know, who gets to define the limits of uh, how I'm allowed to enhance myself? And, um, you know, what, why, why can't I do anything I like to my body? Why, why would you stop me? Well, two thoughts. One is I think there's sort of a natural time scale over which human augmentation uh, sort of naturally becomes socially acceptable, right? So again, you know, there are examples of uh, technologies um, I mentioned earlier how deep brain stimulation originally was used for very severely afflicted uh, people with certain movement disorders, and then about uh, 11 years ago, there were the first trials for depression and other, you know, and, and, and the use has been broadening. And so I think there's sort of a natural, uh, I hesitate to use the phrase common sense because it sounds like it's trivializing the, the way to think about it, but, but you know, as technologies are, uh, you know, more safe and efficacious and they're proven over time, then it makes sense to deploy them more. Now, as for the individual rights, which is sort of the flip side of the coin, um, I think that uh, if you look at technologies that we have on the outside of our bodies, like, you know, we all have on our bodies right now multiple computers probably, you know, phones and many people have cameras and laptops and so forth, uh, there's certainly uh, uh, almost zero stigma associated with enhancing that external aspect of our intelligence, right? We can look up you know, any fact that's publicly accessible with a few touches on a screen and so forth. So then the question becomes, well, is our thinking different for things that go inside the body? And if so, why? And the more I thought about it, I wonder if it really does boil down to, even if it's a bit un unconscious, this question of risk versus reward. You know, something that's put in the body, do we really know uh, what kinds of long-term effects would occur? Are there side effects? Are there changes um, that are um, mysterious that we cannot anticipate? And frankly, we might, we might want to think more about those things and our external devices. You know, there are increasing numbers of uh, people asking questions about whether, you know, relying on devices for certain kinds of things changes our cognitive abilities, right? Do we get too distracted? Uh, is multitasking, you know, killing creativity is a headline I think we've all seen multiple times in the last year alone. Um, and so maybe what this leads to is this idea that we should be always curious and, and asking questions about all the technologies we, we use um, to augment our abilities, whether they're you know, implanted and therefore maybe, uh, or, or taken in a pill form and therefore highly salient and attention grabbing in their possibility of side effect. But also there's a lot of stuff just in our environment that I think we should be more curious about. Uh, Jinan, are you gonna let me have one of your, uh, your biochips to stick inside myself? Will you do it for me? Uh, for you? For me, yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> oh, maybe for me, we have preferential <laughs> yeah. treatment here. Yeah. That sounds good. Who not? gets to decide then, you know, where we draw that line on, on enhancements? And is it always going to be a medicinal case? Or could you see your devices, if they were, you know, demonstrated to be safe, having a recreational use? And would you be comfortable with that? Um, um, so, uh, my, yeah, my devices right now, as I said, is a clinical, sorry, preclinical level. But in the future, yeah, what if uh, we can place the device in our brain uh, with a socket so that we can change the devices back and forth with different types and at different uh, events. Um, but yeah, for us, comfort, comfort of the device is important because uh, we would like to have the devices in a mechanically adaptive format so that they can have an intimate integration with your skin and organs and as well as um, capture all uh, um, um, various signals from your body and then uh, um, 
tell your future what will happen to you in the future. Oh, as someone once said to me when I told them about my hearing hack, they said, it's just so cool, it's like you've got an upgrade slot in your head. Uh, which I quite liked. I like thinking of myself, not yeah. as disabled, but having an upgrade slot in my head. Uh, we are out of time, so please join me in giving a big round of applause to our three speakers, Ed Boyden, Kanan Tech Devrin, and Ned David. <laughs>